In this video, we're going to be talking about solutions and factors that affect the solubility of, of molecules in solution. So by now, you should have an, an idea of what a solution is composed of. And solutions are composed of two different components. They're composed of the solute and the solvent. Typically, water is the most common solvent that's used. And when we talk about solutions, we oftentimes talk about table salt being dissolved into water or even sugar being dissolved into water. Now, something that you probably have experienced uh, is, or you've seen it, if you take oil, it doesn't matter if it's motor oil or vegetable oil that you cook with, if you put that into water, what happens to it? The oil floats on top of the water. Now, the question is, if I take that pot of water or, or any any amount of that water with the oil and I put it on the stove and I turn it on high, it's going to get really hot. A lot of times you can d dissolve stuff based off of temperature. Now, in this case, let's say I do that and I take a, a stirring rod and I stir it up vigorously and I get all that oil down into the, to the water. As soon as I stop doing that, where's the oil go? Back to the surface. So. In this particular case, the question is, why is it that oil will not dissolve into water? Now, that's where this slide comes into play. Chemists use the axiom, light dissolves light. And so, when we talk about light dissolving light, we have to go back and we have to think about, you know, the polarity of that molecule, whether the molecule being polar or nonpolar. So, polar it will dissolve into polar substances and nonpolar will dissolve into nonpolar substances in this case the solvent now in the table that you see here this table has several different compounds and if you pay attention to it it shows the solubility of that in water and in c6h14 which is hexane and hexane is a very common solvent that you use in the organic lab so when we look at methanol methanol is a very small compound. It's a polar compound on top of that because it has the alcohol group. It has a very short carbon chain. So it's going to be readily soluble in water. And you can see that it's infinitely soluble in water. Methanol dissolves very easily into water. However, if you look at the hexane, well, since methanol is, is more polar than nonpolar, it's going to have a much more difficult time dissolving into hexane and that's where that 0.12 comes into play now as we move up into the number of carbons in the chain we see ethanol has two carbons now we see that ethanol still is soluble in water but what happens here is that now we've got a little bit more of a nonpolar side to it with those two carbons in that chain and so that makes it very soluble in hexane now, if you pay attention to the pattern, as you go down in that table, you'll see that the number of carbons increases. Once you get to four carbons, where you have butanol, because you have the you know, have four carbons, that's where the butane, and you have the alcohol, that's where the OL comes from. Uh, this compound here is more nonpolar than polar. It still has a little bit of polarity to it because of the alcohol group. And that's going back to those hydrogen bonds that it forms with the water molecules. But the rest of that chain is going to be nonpolar. And so it's going to be just slightly soluble in water, but it's going to be very soluble in hexane. So when you add on more carbons, the rule of thumb is it starts to become more nonpolar and it's going to dissolve into a nonpolar solvent versus your polar solvent water. So that's just one thing we have to look at. We have to focus on you know what the formula is. We have to focus on the structure and whether it's polar or nonpolar. So the when we talk about the intermolecular forces, I started talking about hydrogen bonding. So the we talked about intermolecular forces in the previous video, and with that you have to pay attention to whether it's hydrogen bonding, London dispersion, dipole dipole, what intermolecular force is the dominant force, and that sort of is what is the telltale as to whether it's going to dissolve into water or hexane in this case. Now we have two molecules on the right. We have glucose and then we have cyclohexane. 
of these two, which one do you think is going to be more soluble in water? We have to pay attention to the functional group. In the case, it's highlighted in the glucose molecule. And you see that there's multiple alcohol groups found throughout the, the structure of glucose. And, you know, glucose is basically sugar. You put sugar in the water, what does it do? You can, it dissolves. It dissolves very easily into water. And you could dissolve an entire bag if you have the water warm enough. However, cyclohexane is different. Cyclohexane is, is a nonpolar substance, and cyclohexane will not dissolve into water. It will, it will dissolve into hexane, though, because it's being nonpolar. And glucose would not dissolve into hexane because glucose is polar and would dissolve more into water. So you have to pay attention to what functional groups. How do those functional groups play into the solubility, the intermolecular forces, per se, and ultimately the polarity of that molecule? So here are two more examples. We have vitamin A and we have vitamin C. Obviously, you look at vitamin A, what's this, what sticks out to you? It's the carbon chain. It has a very long carbon chain. It has one alcohol group, but that one alcohol group does not make a whole lot of difference in this structure's polarity. This compound is more nonpolar, and so vitamin A would not dissolve into water. It would dissolve into hexane, or in, in this case, a fatty tissue like your eyeball. Now, vitamin A is good for your eyes. However, vitamin C, vitamin C, it has these alcohol groups spread all around it and even has these oxygens off to the left and the top. This is a very polar substance since vitamin C dissolves into water very easily. So structure plays a critical role. You've got to pay attention to the size of the structure. You've got to look at, you know, how many alcohol groups are there, what type of functional groups are present. And you have to be able to determine whether the molecule is more polar or more nonpolar. And, that, and that, you just have to practice that to get a little bit better at it. But in this case here, you can see there's obvious difference between the two. And, that, and that's what makes the difference whether it's going to dissolve into water or a nonpolar substance like hexane. Now gases are different. The gases interact with the solution based off of their mass and so larger molecules have more dispersion forces remember dispersion forces are those London dispersion forces and the bigger molecules the more polarizability they have uh, and so they are able to dissolve into water a lot easier so what's a gas that you know of that dissolves into water co2 right where do you find co2 at you find CO2 in a lot of your drinks that you drink, eat tonic water, all those uh, energy drinks that you find, they have that CO2 in them. Soft drinks are, are good. Now, if you the, the only problem is that gases do not typically stay dissolved in solution very long. Some stay longer than others, and that's what we're looking at here is that the, ma the, the molar mass of the compound really plays a critical role. And how long that the, the gas will be soluble in solution. So the solubility of liquids and solids does not change with pressure. However, gases do change with pressure because gas, you know, pressure affects the way a gas interacts with its environment. So the, so the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to its pressure. So as you apply more pressure, you're going to cause that gas to become more soluble in solution. Think about all your drinks. They come out of the out of the machines with high pressure. When you go to open the bottle up, it releases that pressure and you hear it. Psh! And so that's where the pressure comes into play. Now, if they didn't pressurize the container, the, the gases would, would come out a lot quicker. And when you open the drink, it would become flat. Now, if you let it sit long enough, eventually the pressure is going to change, and there is expiration dates on the uh, on the bottles. So, so this all follows Henry's law, and where the solubility of the gas is equal to K times P. K is the is the Henry's law constant for that gas. Remember that each gas has its own individual solubility. 
and that's where k k typically is a constant constants don't change but the constants in henry's law do change based off the gas because all gases are a little different and the pressure is the amount of partial pressure of the gas above the surface of the liquid now you have to look these values of k up in your textbooks in the in the tables of, that you find in this chapter which is chapter 13 if you're using trove so so henry's law again just describes the solubility of a gas based off henry's law's constant and the pressure that's above the surface of the liquid and in this case here you this would be the area that would represent the partial pressure of that gas above the liquid so now temperature plays a critical role so we talked about factors that affect solubility we, we've looked at structure as one pressure is another and the third one is temperature temperature is a critical thing that that we all use and so if you've ever made sweet tea what do you do with the tea before you add the sugar you heat it up in a microwave or on the stove top and then you add your sugar because you can add as much sugar as you want and so if you ever go to mcdonald's you know that mcdonald's will give you diabetes right off the bat because they put so much sugar in there you almost have to take water and dilute the tea before you drink it so now all this is pertaining to the solubility curve and so we talked about temperature and solubility most salts will increase in their solubility as the temperature increases there's only one on this chart that you see that does the opposite but most of them are going to go up and even NaCl goes up but it doesn't go up by much it still goes up as the temperature increases so this so these curves that you're seeing here and if we look at NaCl this curve that you see going across that represents the solubility point at that temperature and so if i were to work at let's say 20 degrees temperature celsius all right and i would come up and say okay what's the solubility of nacl at that temperature that would be 35 grams of nacl per 100 grams of water so if i were to measure out the mass of water i measure out 100 grams i can only put 35 grams of nacl at 20 degrees celsius if I go up to 200 grams, well, then I can add in 70 grams. So this chart helps you to sort of figure out the solubility of, of that salt at that temperature. And these, these curves that you're seeing here are really the saturation points. You cannot add, so at 20 degrees Celsius, you can't add any more NaCl. You can't go above the line. So, this, so these are your saturated points. And so... If we look at KN3, KN3 is, in, is unique in the sense that if we go up to, let's say, 70 degrees Celsius, so we go up to 70 degrees, and we go up, and we never interact with that line for KN3. What's that mean? That means that you can add as much KN3 as you want at 70 degrees Celsius because you're never going to reach the saturation point for KN3. It's like sugar. Sugar is very similar to KNO3 in that once you get it to a certain temperature, you'll never be able to reach the saturation point. If you if you heat up water to almost boiling, you could dump a five pound bag of sugar in the water. Now, if I come down to 40 degrees Celsius for KNO3, I can see that, hey, we're gonna reach our saturated point and that saturated point for KNO3 is right at around 63 grams per 100 grams of water you can't go over because that would be considered super saturated super saturated is a little different but in this on this curve here we're focused on the saturation point at a specific temperature so temperature does play a critical role within the solubility of these salts it does play a critical role within gases too and the it, it, the opposite effect is shown for gases if you increase the temperature of a gas solution then you are going to decrease the solubility of that gas so as i was saying the temperature does have a, an effect on the solubility of the gases and 
solids, but in this case we see the example for the gases are that the solubility goes down as the temperature increases. You got to think about that for a second. You know, when you talk about the, the, when you look in summertime and you go to the small ponds, a lot of times you'll find that there are dead fish floating in the top. And it's not a coincidence because the temperature of that pond increases. As that temperature increases, the solubility of the oxygen gas in that pond decreases. And so the fish basically die because of a lack of oxygen that's in the water. And so uh, in the wintertime, we don't see that because you know, the temperature in the wintertime is a lot lower. So there's less oxygen escaping. And you know that if you leave your, your bottle of, of drink in the, in the car, it gets extremely hot. In fact, it, it, it makes the drink go flatter even quicker. That's the reason why we put our drinks in the refrigerator and get them cold because they stay crispier longer and it, it just tastes better. So nobody likes a flat drink. All right, so there's a couple examples. And we did look at these two with the vitamin C and vitamin E earlier. And we talked about the fact of why vitamin C would be more soluble in water than vitamin A. Uh, question one up there says, predict whether the following substance will dissolve into uh, carbon tetrachloride, which is nonpolar, or into water. All right, C7H16 is a long carbon chain. If you were to draw that out, you'd have seven carbons and all the hydrogens would be dispersed around it. C7H16 would be a nonpolar substance. So which one do you think it would dissolve into? Sodium sulfate is an ionic compound, and sodium sulfate being an ionic compound would dissolve into the CCL4 or water. Which one do you think? HCl, if you draw the Lewis structure, you find that HCl has a permanent dipole moment. That's a good indicator where it might dissolve into better. And then last, I2 has no dipole moment. It's, it's what you'd consider to be blank. What do you think that would dissolve into? All right, so C7816 is nonpolar, it dissolves into CCO4. Sodium sulfate is ionic, it would dissolve into water. HCl is polar, because it has that permanent dipole, it would dissolve into water. And then I2, being that it has no dipole moment, it's considered to be nonpolar, it would dissolve into CCO4. So ways of expressing concentrations, that is going to be the next video that, that you see posted. So for now, we're going to stop here. I uh, hope you guys have learned a little bit about solubility of solids and gases in solution. If you have any questions, make sure you ask. Thanks.